Good morning. Welcome to this Global Forest Summit organized by Reforest Action and Open Diplomacy under the high patronage of Mr. Emmanuel Macron, President, uh, President of the French Republic. I'm Stéphane Halle, I'm the founder of Reforest Action and co-organizer of this Global Forest Summit, and I would like to ap apologize for the uh, delay of this uh, session. Thank you very much, uh, very much for joining this session about the momentum to accelerate forest protection and restoration. We're in 2021, and the forests are at a turning point. 10 million hectares are deforested every year, fueling global warming and biodiversity loss. The need to accelerate the fight against deforestation and forest degradation has never been more important. At the same time, the IPCC estimates that among the measures that will contribute to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, by the end of the century, the world needs more than 1 billion hectares of forest to reach the objective by 2050. Yet, only 1% of the funding dedicated to fight against climate change focuses on the so-called nature-based solutions, among which restoration of ecosystems. How? How can we actively reinforce the fight against deforestation in 2021? How can we restore forest in a sustainable way, considering they will provide us with a diversity of ecosystem services? Which actors, partnerships, and funding should this global momentum be developed with? Now, to explore this subject, we're lucky enough to have first-class experts at this round table. They will share their views on the subject. And I would like to introduce Tim, Tim Christopherson. Thank you, Tim, for being with us. You're the head of nature for climate of the UN Environment Programme, coordinator of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Welcome, Tim. We've got Thomas Crover with us. Hi, Thomas. You're the chief scientific advisor of the UN Trillion Tree Campaign and the founder of the Crover Lab. We've got Mark Palahi with us as well. Hi, Mark. You're the coordinator of the Circular Bioeconomy Alliance and the director of the European Forest Institute. We've got Nicole Schwab, director for nature-based solutions of the World Economic Forum and co-director of 1T, 1T.org. And we've got Laurent. Good morning, Laurent. Good morning. You're the CEO of NSC. Is the age of NEC the age of LVMH? Kind of. Yeah, it is. And we have, or we will have, Jen Goodall, um, who is the uh, founder of the Jen Goodall Institute and the UN Messenger of Peace. She will join us in a minute. Tom, I'd like to, talk, to, to start with you, if, if you, if you're okay with that. Um, we need to act. We know we need to fight against deforestation. We need to restore forests uh, around the world, but do we know how big we need to grow, how bold we need to be? Great. Thanks so much for the introduction. Such an exciting panel. Um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll start with the sort of the, the basics of it all. And, and I think the most fundamental thing is that decades and decades of research have shown us how valuable natural ecosystems are for the survival of people around the world. And it's obviously no coincidence that local economies and human well-being consistently plummet when nature is severely degraded because we can't survive on a on a dead land um, but it's not all about nature as everybody here knows it's nature and biodiversity are intrinsically important in their own right as the sort of magic of our universe um, but it's only in recent years we've been beginning to understand the scale of these systems um, due to Im immense developments in technology we've been able to really understand particularly the enormous human footprint um, about two thirds of vegetative land surface is often is used for agriculture. And given that less than half of that ends up on, on people's plates, it actually means that almost a third of the vegetative land surface is actually used to produce waste. Uh, and what's even more scary than that is that as individuals, we're not connected to that. We don't understand our footprints or our connection to the nature we use. So we've lost around half of the six trillion trees that once existed on our planet emitting 
hundreds of trillions of tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, obviously accelerating climate change. But the research is also showing that there's immense opportunity in, in the conservation and restoration efforts. And if we could protect the 0.9 billion hectares of land around the world and allow the vegetation and the soils to trap carbon from the atmosphere, they could capture up to 30% of the excess carbon uh, that's in the atmosphere as a result of human activity. And obviously that's only going to work if we have long-term sustainable and resilient ecosystems that are, that are comprised of the right mixtures of diverse species. And the relevance of all of this for climate change means that it's received huge attention uh, in recent years, but it's, I think, incredibly critical for us to sort of change the scope of this, to understand that this is a local challenge for the local biodiversity and the people who depend on it. And it's only when that collective action of millions of bottom-up efforts start to connect, connect that we see the global benefits for all of us. So it's essential for us to understand the local perspectives in all around the world and that those perspectives are different. In some parts of the world, restoration means the conservation of existing ecosystems to support the strong, last strongholds of biodiversity. Uh, in others, it's the protection of land so nature can recover naturally or the holistic management of soils so that veg vegetation can return. Or, or planting trees in agroforestry systems can be so essential for bringing economic benefits to local communities. And it's those economic benefits that are the key to making this sustainable in the long term. So to facilitate this, we've been trying to connect with practitioners all across the world to try to understand their needs. And there's a growing network. We've got about 50,000 locations around the world where someone is managing, conserving or restoring ecosystems. And we've tried to build a platform called Restore to facilitate those needs. But we needed to start by asking them what those needs are. And through extensive discussion with all of that wide network, we learned one key thing is that all of their needs are different. Some people wanted to know which species are native in the region or which species of plants will survive in the future. Others wanted to know about the potential for carbon storage or capture in the future. But across all of those hundreds of needs, there were two unifying features that consistently emerged that everybody needs. Transparency is the first one. People need to be able to show that what they're doing on the ground so that there can be context and they can understand the, the challenges and needs of the local practitioners around the world and so that they can connect and find uh, with, the, with their other collaborators and partners and funders and show them the impacts that are happening on the ground. And the second, the sort of impact of that transparency is the second key feature, which is the need for connectivity of this network. There needs to be the ability to find one another, to learn from each other's successes and failure, to understand the challenges that people are facing around the world so that they can share that collective knowledge and grow. But that network of connectivity needs to extend beyond just the practitioners on the ground to include the entire market space so that practitioners can find the sustainable food suppliers, timber, textiles, carbon credits, or anyone else that's, that's you know, bringing economic value to the, to the incredible land management efforts. So with these two core concepts, this transparency and connectivity, we've been, it, it, those two concepts in mind, we've been building uh, Restore with, with Google to try to model it on the user-friendly style of Google, Google Maps to bring that transparency to these 50,000 locations around the world so that they can see every single plant changing over time. And also so that those projects can find one another and get connected and plugged into this global movement. So Restore will be launching uh, in June at the same time as the UN Decade to try to facilitate that incredible uh, interdisciplinary movement. But the next steps for us are going to be to try to engage the marketplace so that every organization that has a land footprint, so that every coffee shop owner, so that every coffee shop customer can see exactly where the plants that, those, that, that coffee came from and the community that's managing it. So eventually we can all start to plug in and make decisions that can impact our sustainable future. So I guess the take home is that for a global restoration movement to be sustainable, it really needs all of us. Yes, we need transparency, we need monitoring. Um, I mentioned the uh, figure of 1 billion hectares of forest to be, re to be restored within the, uh, the next few years. What do you think about this figure? Is it, is it something that you are aligned with? So we estimated that the number is slightly less than that, around 0.9 billion. But yeah, I think one, one is a nice catchy number that everyone can get around. So, but that is the, the estimated extent of the sort of degrade, degraded areas that are available for possible regeneration. And if we can improve the efficiency of agriculture as well, that, that number is only going to grow and that potential will increase. Yeah, it's, it's a fairly big number, actually. I think it's the equivalent of the, um, 
of the United States. Um, but um, Tim, I was wondering, is there an international response to, to this challenge? I mean, we're talking about huge figures. We need states, we need the UN to drive the change. What, what is your response to that? Thank you, Stefan. Uh, the, the UN General Assembly passed a resolution uh, in 2019 to declare the years 2021 to 2030 the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. And the aim is nothing less than to prevent, halt and reverse the degradation of ecosystems worldwide. It's not a small task, but it comes at a very good time when the world has realized that we've overshot the planetary boundaries. Let's remember that we are in the COVID crisis, but even normal was a crisis. We had a climate crisis, we had a biodiversity crisis, and those haven't gone away. So we have to use the crisis that we're in now and the recovery to also rebuild nature. UNA put out a report two weeks ago about the greenness of stimulus recovery measures. It's about $15 trillion pumped into global economies at the moment. Um, uh, unfortunately, less than 15% of that is in some way green, and we can do better for restoration. And in the UN Decade on Existing Restoration Strategy, we estimate that we'll need around $1 trillion between now and 2030 to make these investments into big restoration at scale, like the Bond Challenge with 350 million hectares of forests and landscapes to be restored. And that $1 trillion is about 0.1% of global domestic economic product between now and 2030. If we as humanity can't invest less than 1% back into nature that sustains us, then uh, it is uh, maybe a fate that we deserve that we find ourselves in right now. Because it is a logical conclusion that if we want to fight the twin crisis of climate change and biodiversity loss, and improve people's livelihoods at the same time, nature-based solutions must play a key role. And ecosystem restoration is simply an idea whose time has come. So on the 5th of June this year on World Environment Day, we're launching the United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration with many of the people on this uh, panel and in the audience already as partners. We invite everybody to join generation restoration and to build this true global movement. The strategy has basically three objectives. We want to build and sustain the global movement, as Tom said, and he's and others are helping us uh, to do that. Out of that, we want to build more political will of senior decision makers so that even ministers of finance can change the way that billions of dollars of taxpayer money, instead of being pumped into fossil fuel subsidies, would be directed towards nature. And finally, we need to build the capacity to do all that, the financial, the technical capacity, and to monitor. And for that, we're working together with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN. They have uh, now, I think, 80 organizations working together on the monitoring framework for the UN decade so that we also know where we're going and if things are going in the right way. So thank you again, Stefan, and back over to you. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, as far as I know, I think the... Um the UN decade um, that we're entering now um, is the biggest call to action for um, uh, ecosystem restoration uh, that ever uh, happened. So um, well done uh, and thank you for, for leading the change. And again, restoring ecosystems is key, but it comes in addition to preserving um, existing forests. Otherwise, uh, I don't know where this will end up uh, actually, but you know, we, what we've seen is that there is a, a strong target. We need, we need to act big, and we're acting big. We need transparency. We, we have the right practices, but nobody can do that on his own, right? We cannot um, restore 49 or 1 billion hectares uh, ourselves. And this is why there are some um, multi-stakeholders coalitions that emerges so uh, to, to gather the right people uh, to deliver, to restore uh, what needs to be restored, all these forests. And um, I would like, Nicole, if, if I may, can, can you please tell us what WANTE is and uh, what you would like to achieve with this coalition? 
Thank you, Stefan. Yes, so Wanti.org is the World Economic Forum's Trillion Trees platform, which was set up to support the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. And we see ourselves as a platform to bring everyone together and to support this global movement of organizations and people who have been working on forest conservation and restoration for decades. Um, and today, as, as Tom and Tim said, I mean, we're facing an urgency. We, really, we have 10 years to turn this around. And the scale of the ambition of what we have to restore is huge. And what that needs is two things. One, everyone needs to engage and work together. And two, we need massive investment. I mean, you mentioned it at the beginning, Stefan, less than one or 3% of climate finance goes to natural climate solutions. That's just one piece of it. Um, Tim mentioned that we need $1 trillion to be invested uh, in this area. So we really need to mobilize the private sector. And that's where the World Economic Forum's contribution to this movement is also to start to make the business case for companies to engage and commit to conserving and restoring forests. I mean, ecosystems more broadly, but forests in particular, because we know that these play such an essential role. And there is more and more enthusiasm um, among companies, and, and we've seen more and more commitments in terms of tree planting. But of course, this needs to be channeled in the right direction, because as, as you just mentioned, it's not only about restoring and planting new trees, but um, mostly how can we protect the existing forests? And if we look at, you know, if we do the analysis of natural climate solutions and their contribution uh, to emissions reduction to, to address the climate crisis, half of that contribution comes from protecting the forests and peatlands that we have. So this is, I mean, even if you, you look at it from a purely analytical point of view, there is no way around it. And, and that's without even going into all the massive benefits of forests. We need forests for, for the water, for the air, for the livelihoods, for the soil. So I think there's um, increasing um, momentum, increasing enthusiasm, there's increasing movement in starting to value forests and value natural, natural capital properly, um, which will enable this shift in the economic systems that we need. Um, uh, forests are estimated and, and their ecosystem services are estimated to have a value of between 50 trillion and 150 trillion. Um, so if we're just looking at these different numbers, there's really, there's a huge disconnect and we have to start operating differently. So our role is to mobilize the private sector to make sure that these commitments are channeled towards best practices in terms of ecological impact, uh, right tree, right place, and also uh, social and economic impact and working with local communities and to build, as you said, Stefan, these multi-stakeholder platforms that enable these different actors to speak together. And as Thomas said, to kind of build this chain between the global dialogue and what happens on the ground, which of course is very challenging because there are so many actors and that's why we need these coalitions to start to come together, channel the big commitments and, and sums of money to the actual implementation on the ground and impact for people's livelihoods. Thank you, Nicole. What is interesting about one tier is every time we, we participate to, um, to working groups, there are representatives for a number of organizations. It's impressing from uh, you know, um, landowners in Africa to uh, big corporate leaders and, and politics. And uh, thank you for, for what you're doing. It's a very ambitious uh, um, coalition, this, this one tier. Um, but as I often say, everybody needs to uh, take part. Um, preserving forests, restoring forests should be everybody's subject. And um, different coalitions uh, emerge. And uh, we've got here with us uh, Laurent. Laurent, again, you're the CEO of NSC. And you've, you're a corporate leader, right? And you've decided, for some reason, to protect and restore forests. Can, can you tell us why? Well, first of all, I would say is, you know, it's because we know uh, that we have, we have to do something about it, right? And uh, personally, I've been involved in, the, in this matter uh, for the last 15 years, you know, trying to contribute, you know, and, and as I say, you know, do my share and a little more um, and to face, you know, both um, the issue of uh, climate and biodiversity. And I started with bees, you know, I've done a lot for bees uh, with also the, my company and now uh, we go for, uh, for trees. You know, in fact, you know, uh, I'm using this panel because uh, uh, if I make the summary of, this, of, the, of the setting of why we are, we are going that direction, you know, urgency is clear, 
and I, I'm hearing again, you know, we have 10 years in front of us, okay? And I think, you know, peace, uh, and I'm sure we'll speak about peace, peace is in danger. Uh, forest is one of the solutions. It's forest and not trees, you know, uh, certainly. Uh, thanks to the work of, of Tom, you know, the, the, one, the one trillion trees, and the good news also from, from that work, you know, it's, you know, there is space available somewhere. Now, then also we have people like you, because, you know, they know how to engineer, you know, how to, uh, to do the reforestations, and then it's about, you know, money, always about money. And in fact, my evaluations, because what mentioned one trillion um, um, dollars, you know, I, I, I try to play uh, a bit above, uh, up to, you know, up to three trillions. And because you know it's a huge stake, then we need a radical, uh, a radical and urgent move. So that's why also I wanted to contribute. You know, we we just started. You know, what we call the, uh, a do tank, a do tank. It's time for uh, for thinking. There is time for finding solutions. It's high times for action. And we are we are not the the, the, the only one for sure. You're saying you, know, you need millions of projects, but we want to do something that is you know, is, ha is having an impact. So that do tank, what it is. Uh, it's a group now of like-minded people, of women and men, and uh, we join forces, you know. And, and in fact, in the companies, also we want to transcend the issues of competition. That is a collective action. It's not something we want to own. We don't want to own the forest action. Uh, and, and then what we do, in fact, you know, we invest. It's about, you know, getting the money and then using the money right, and that's where no, we, in fact, you know, liaise with people like you, and in fact, we are liaising with reforest action because you know how to engineer the, the, uh, the, the restorations of the forest. And um, we are just nine for the moment, just a group of nine, uh, but uh, hoping that we'll be uh, mm. even, even, even more. It's like, you know, often say, we are on the way to Saint-Jacques de Compostelle, so some people are starting from different cities, and sometimes, sometimes, we, we work with many. And what we do, I want to just make an echo to what you said before. We do act, it's first. Second, we, we share practices and KPIs and monitoring, using the KPIs also of that panel. And then we are embarking others. You know, a part of the time is also to say, come join us and we'll do much more than our share. This is the beauty of forest, isn't it? It's, it's gather people. Uh, you're in a position where you, you're happy to discuss with competitors. Yeah. Um, when, when it's about forest, which is quite positive for me. Um, now, Mark, Mark, where are you? Um, you're the coordinator of the Circular Bioeconomy Alliance. D could you please tell us why do we need to move towards a circular bioeconomy? What is it? Um, and then could you please tell me what the Circular Bioeconomy Alliance is, please? Thank you, Stefan. Well, basically, we need to move towards a circular bioeconomy because after relying for more than 100 years on a linear fossil-based economy, we have arrived at the tipping point. Our world has become too big for our planet. And by the way, the current pandemic is not bad luck or yet another crisis. It's just another consequence of the same problem. Yeah? It is the tip of the iceberg of a much larger crisis, the crisis of our economic system. A system, remember, that is addicted to fossil resources and to growth at all costs, that has failed to value our most important capital and the basis for human health and well-being, which is nature. And having arrived at such tipping point, I think it's good to remember the words of Albert Einstein, who said that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking that we had when we created them. And this is exactly what we need now, a new way of thinking as basis for a new economic paradigm. One, where prosperity takes place within our planetary boundaries, because we have only one planet, an economic paradigm where life becomes both its true engine and its true purpose. And this is what some of us call the circular bioeconomy, which places nature and people at its center. Because a circular bioeconomy basically is about investing in nature as the true engine of our economy. It's about managing sustainably our biological systems to produce in a synergistic way food, energy, ecosystem services, bio-based solutions to decarbonize our economy while restoring natural capital, which is the foundation for a sustainable circular bioeconomy. And all that by creating new jobs and inclusive prosperity. 
So basically the circular bioeconomy is an economy that prospers in harmony with nature, powered by nature. And the Prince of Wales, His Royal Highness established the Circular Bioeconomy Alliance last autumn with the intention to speed up, to accelerate the transition from the linear fossil-based economy towards a circular bioeconomy. And the starting point was the understanding that that transition requires the greatest economic transformation in human history. Think about the speed and the scale of change that we need to put forward in the next three decades. Basically in three decades, we need to move towards a climate neutral, nature positive and inclusive economy that operates within the renewable boundaries of our planet. This is an unprecedented challenge, but it is also the greatest business opportunity of the 21st century, a century that will be the century of biology or it will not be. So the Alliance, what tries to do is to connect investors to investable solutions, because at the end of the day, we will only make this transformation if we manage to mobilize the right scale of investments and develop the right uh, sustainable business models. So through the Alliance, we are trying to connect the dots, to connect investors to sustainable investable projects within the Circular Bioeconomy Alliance. And one of the main outcomes of the Alliance in the, in the first months has been the development of a natural capital investment fund by the Bank Lombardier, which is one of the founding members of the Alliance. Already $580 million have been uh, mobilized, redirected, yeah, financial capital that has been redirected to, to fund circular bioeconomy companies. And one of the main focus of the Alliance will be on restoring natural capital, because we believe that creating regenerative landscapes in a holistic manner can be the, act, the actual catalyst to put forward the transformational change that we need to move towards a circular bioeconomy. And Stefan, we are very happy that you have joined the Alliance and we have high expectations for you to, to make this transformation possible. So looking forward to work with you. Thank you, I'll do my best, Mark. Uh, but I'm only uh, one contributor and, and the beauty about uh, you know, 1T, Imagine or, or the CBA, it's there are correlations. It's not individuals working on their own. It's, uh, uh, acknowledging the fact that uh, when we're together, we're stronger. Um, now, I wonder if these coalitions um, lead us to a new relationship to nature. And um, this is the next subject I would like to address with you. But before we discuss that, we wanted to invite um, Prince Apollinaire Usulio, who is the president of Grab Bénin. Uh, but for technical reasons, he could not be live, but he recorded a video I would like us to, to listen from, uh, from Bena. Mon nom c'est Apollinaire Ousulio, je suis prince euh, des Tolinous. Et aujourd'hui, nous, fais, nous faisons face à une déforestation des menaces sur les espèces végétales, surtout les forêts. Nous, en tant que peuple indigène et gardien de la mère nature, je pense qu'il est euh, très important pour nous à ce que nous puissions conserver la forêt par la sanctuarisation. Sacraliser les forêts, reconnaître les forêts comme aussi partie intégrante de notre vie, nous devons travailler pour. Aujourd'hui, nous sommes très menacés parce que le capitalisme, l'économie... Euh, on, 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 nous, on nous fait miroiter de l'économie verte, mais au fait, c'est de l'illusion, d'autant plus que les, les, les crédits carbone, euh, ce qu'on nous dit par rapport au carbone, euh, c'est comme si nous sommes en train de commercialiser la nature. Nous ne pouvons pas commercialiser nous-mêmes parce que nous faisons partie de la nature. Et en jury prudent de la terre, nous ne sommes pas venus de, sur la terre, nous sommes venus de la terre. Ça veut dire que si nous faisons euh, mal à la nature, nous faisons mal à nous. Parce que, au fait, les hommes dépendent intégralement de la forêt. La forêt peut vivre sans les hommes, mais les humains ne peuvent pas vivre sans la forêt. C'est notre garde-manger, c'est notre devenir, c'est notre avenir, et nous devons protéger ça. C'est pour cela qu'il est impérieux que vous, nous, pouvons, nous allons protéger la nature pour nous protéger nous-mêmes. Nous devons aussi aller au-delà de nos discours et ne pas prendre 
la nature comme un fonds de commerce. Donc les illusions, les grands rassemblements qui amènent juste à parler de l'homme dans des principes anthropocentriques où nous pensons à nous et à nous seuls, sans penser à nos frères et sœurs arbres et les animaux sauvages, ça serait le pire pour nous sur cette terre. L'enfer n'est pas loin quand on n'aura plus de forêt, quand on n'aura plus de l'eau potable, parce que ces forêts jouent un rôle primordial dans le changement climatique. Et les effets pervers du changement climatique aujourd'hui ne peuvent pas être atténués atténué si nous ne faisons pas l'important en gardant nos forêts intactes. Voilà le message. Nous ne sommes pas isolés dans ce combat. Ce qui se passe ailleurs, en Amazonie et chez nous, nous devons aussi rester solidaires pour que toute la planète soit conservée, toute la planète, au moins le reste des forêts qui sont sur la planète, soit conservé et soit gardé dignement pour la génération future. Nous devons vivre ensemble, vivre en harmonie avec la nature pour permettre à ce que, pour les générations à venir, que nous puissions avoir une planète aussi verte et tout aussi vivable que nos ancêtres nous ont légués. Il y a déjà des désordres, mais il faut qu'on arrête la saignée pour permettre de vivre aussi longtemps sur cette terre. Voilà le message. Et je voudrais Écoutez, dis à tous les dirigeants du nord au sud que nous avons intérêt à vivre en harmonie avec la nature, à conserver la nature, à sanctuariser les forêts et à garder ces forêts-là pour aussi longtemps que possible. Seules les forêts peuvent nous permettre de vivre durablement à travers l'oxygène que nous avons, à travers l'assainissement, à travers la pluie que cela nous permet d'avoir. Nous avons besoin. Nous avons absolument besoin. Et le combat n'est pas le combat seulement des indigènes. Les, nos indigènes aussi doivent s'associer à ça. Ce n'est pas un combat pour l'Afrique, pour le Bénin seul. Tout le monde est concerné. Tout le monde est coupable par rapport à ce système. Et nous devons travailler maintenant ensemble pour le changement de paradigme, revoir la planète verte, sanctuariser nos forêts, sacraliser tout ce qu'il y a comme espèce végétale, les forêts surtout, au Bénin, la logique de la forêt sacrée. En Afrique, les forêts et les peuples autochtones sont aussi menacés, comme nos frères en Amazonie d'ailleurs. C'est pour cela que nous devons nous mettre ensemble pour protéger les forêts, parce que c'est la même bande verte qui entoure tout le monde entier. Ensemble, soyons unis pour la conservation de nos ressources naturelles, surtout de nos forêts ancestrales. Voilà ce qui est l'essentiel pour nous. Merci de m'avoir écouté. We need to live in harmony with nature. This is a message uh, I wanted uh, all of us to hear before we debate about our relationship to nature. Now, Nicole, <laughs> it's uh, over to you. you. You describe, you present a, a concept called nature positive transition and regenerative business. How is it aligned with what we've just heard and what is it? Stefan, yes, I think, um, I mean, so much wisdom and, and um, truth in, in what we just heard. And I think we need to shift our relationship with nature. We need to stop having a purely anthropocentric view um, and, and conceive of ourselves as part of nature. And, and what that means is to shift from a space where our activities, our consumption is depleting of nature nature to a, a model whereby we regenerate nature through what we do. And that links to what Mark said in terms of this circular bioeconomy. And on a more macro level, uh, the World Economic Forum, we've been looking at, so what are the sectors, the industries that have the biggest impact on nature loss? And what would it take for a transition towards an economy that was nature positive, which means that the, the outcome of these activities were not depleting, but regenerate, regenerating, and I'll, I'll give you examples. Um, and I think it's, it's very important because we hear, you know, the, the um, let's say the climate crisis and this concept of achieving net zero of, of decarbonization, Um, has become more mainstream. I would say, of course, there's huge work that's still needed there, but we often forget that that's not enough. And what we also need is to be nature positive. And so this is really something that we are working on. And for one trillion trees in particular, 
um, we are supporting the, the restoration generation by um, highlighting and, and helping ecopreneurs scale their initiatives. And what do we mean by an ecopreneur? So an ecopreneur is exactly the model of this new vision, this new relationship with nature. It's an entrepreneur that has as his or her core or their core, because it can be a collective activity, uh, the regeneration of nature and to make that as a source of livelihood. And so we're launching challenges, um, trillion tree challenges, to, to find these ecopreneurs, to encourage them uh, with their activities and to help them scale, because it's, I think, through that that we can start to create this momentum towards this transition to a nature positive, regenerative uh, society and economy. You talk about uh, ecopreneurs. I mentioned um, uh, um, we need to create a generation of uh, reforestation entrepreneurs. I mean, I think we, we're moving in, in the right direction. And don't we think that at the end of the day, carbon offsetting is something that has been driving the world um, for the last decades? And it's still something very, very used today. And it's, uh, there are a lot of debates about this, but today do we need to move beyond that. Um, I, I'd like Mark to, to come back maybe on the few principles of circular bioeconomy, how it goes beyond what we already do today. Thank you, Stefan. So a few reflections from my side. And now, if I may add, because you mentioned now offsetting and, and this compensation, I. I think everybody agrees that we are living the forest momentum, the momentum for tree planting, tree growing. But I think different people see this momentum from different angles. And, and I still think that most of the people uh, believe in this momentum because they still see, look at our forest with the old paradigm lenses, with fossil economy lenses as a compensation for a broken economic system. While I think the momentum is there because we need a transformation towards an economy powered by nature. And forests, at the end of the day, are our most important terrestrial natural capital. Largest terrestrial carbon seeing, main host for biodiversity, largest terrestrial source of precipitation, but they are also the main source for non-food, non-feed, renewable biological resources that we will need to decarbonize our economy. So that is a first reflection. Second reflection, uh, this, the key issue is to address the past failure of our economy to value nature. And we will not do that if we, unless we stop measuring our, the health of our economy by using GDP as a measure. Okay? We need to go beyond GDP and integrate natural capital, human health, human well-being, which is it's absurd that this is not happening, but this is key. Another reflection, uh, a circular bioeconomy, the transformation we need should be holistic. So I see the momentum of a circular bioeconomy as an opportunity to rethink holistically our land, food and health systems as an opportunity to also reimagine our cities and transform key industrial sectors that will need to become carbon neutral and circular in the next decade. Because remember that biological resources, if managed sustainably, are circular and renewable by nature. And therefore, bio-based solutions will need to be an important part of the, of the solution. Um, another reflection, which is a bit, I would say, more profound, the industrial era eh, in which we have been living now for the last 200 years, have resulted in an unprecedented urbanization. Before the Industrial Revolution, 7% of the global population were living in, in cities only. Now in the Western world, 70, 80%, depending on that. This has created a profound disconnection between humanity and nature. If we need to put forward an economy powered by nature, we need to overcome this profound disconnection. Since still people will be living in cities in the next decades, this is clear, they are our innovation hubs, our economic centers. You know, we need to remember the words of Winston Churchill. He said, first we shape our buildings, then they shape us. If we extrapolate that to the level of cities and cities need to be this cat catalyst for change, we need to start shaping our cities if we want our cities to shape ourselves and shape our economy. This means also looking at our cities with ecological lenses. And when we talk about restoration, also include urban areas in that picture. It means building, uh, building our buildings with different materials, replacing steel and concrete by wood, bamboo. It means replacing gray infrastructures by green infrastructures. And final point, uh, we also need to put emphasis in education. Yeah? It's the, 
the best weapon we have to transform the world. And Nelson Mandela said it is education. And we need to rethink the way we are educating our children to connect them since the beginning with nature. If you look most of our schools, which are in fact in cities because we live in cities and look at the number of trees. I am very lucky because I live in Finland and here our children are playing since the very beginning inside the forest. But you know, this is an important factor. Our children will need to continue changing the world. And if this disconnection with nature continue at a, very, a more deep depth sense, we will not manage to do it. So with this, I would like to emphasize that the transformation that we need to put forward is massive. It's at many different levels. And it's important where politicians are designing policies to keep this holistic view, this integrated approach to transformation. Because we are not talking about cosmetics changes or linear changes. Eh? We are not talking about a, a a changing era, but about an era of change. Thank you, Stefan. You know, we, we've, we've heard few words like harmony. Um, it's a very strong word, and I know that it's a, it's a word that the, uh, His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, uses a lot. Um, and uh, again, the Prince of Wales created the circular bioeconomy that you run, Mark. Uh, but we've also heard positiveness, regenerative business, bioeconomy. Um, I would like to understand how big players react to these words, how they see things in the future. And maybe, Tim, you can share with us how states react to that and how they view things on that front. We, we start from a good platform because all governments in the world have adopted the resolution to prevent, halt and reverse the degradation of existence worldwide. So we, even states that normally at the moment uh, are reluctant to commit to more climate action or biodiversity loss. They've all adopted the resolution. I wanted to pick up on what Mark said, that he said the 21st century must be the century of biology. I would go a step further and say it must be the century of ecology. Ecology in ancient Greek oikos means our common home. It's our household. So ecology is the knowledge of how to manage our household earth. Economy has the same root. It's the management of our household. And somewhere along the way, these two concepts got disconnected and they got disconnected at our peril. So we have to get back to the roots of ecology. This has to be the century of ecology and the UN decade on ecosystem restoration can hopefully be the starter for that to raise ecological literacy, ecological awareness amongst ourselves that if we continue to overshoot planetary boundaries, we'll fall off a cliff. I mean, this is something that, uh, that everybody understands and ecology and economy and combining them again into a holistic whole is uh, the way forward. One uh, quick word, and I'm, I'm, I'm keen not to take too much time because I'm very keen to listen to Dr. Jane Goodall, who's I think next on the program, but one, uh, point on nature-based solutions as carbon offsets. It's very important that we don't use nature as an excuse. We can, there are hard to abate and impossible to abate sectors. We cannot use nature as an excuse not to decarbonize the economy deeply everywhere. Nature-based excuses will not do anything for us. They have to be true nature-based solutions that come on top of a deep decarbonization of our economy in all sectors. Thanks. There are very strong words, Tim, uh, from a representative of the UN. And thank you for sharing that with us. I was wondering, Laurent, what about corporates? You, you run a biodiversity-based business, don't you? Exactly. You know, uh, you know it, it, our mission is, in fact, to, uh, to preserve, to develop, and to transmit what we receive. And uh, if I'm, I'm thinking about you know, NSC here, uh, in fact, we are powered by nature. Mm. No, I make something simple to say, uh, no living soils, because that's really you know, what matters for us. No living soils means no grapes, no trees for the barrels, no cognac, no company. So we, we always start by ourselves. And, and then we, know we, do, we do something you know, beyond what, what, uh, what is needed for us. So um, recently, what, what we said, you know, because I, I was thinking about you know, um, do tank. Um, uh, we we, uh, we set ourselves um, the commitment to uh, to uh, to plant 80 million trees within the next 10 years. I, I'm using trees because that's you know kind of measure, but mm. as you know very well, Stefan, in fact, you know it's also based on the uh, 
forest regeneration model that your company is developing, uh, finding the right trees for the right ecosystem. And in our action, I think you know there are three layers. Uh, two layers that are really based on, on uh, our own uh, economic system, and one is beyond that system. The first one is uh, what we do into the one yards, because we know that we can you know, really improve the way um, uh, we treat them, and developing agroforestry. And uh, I want to believe that you know, in an economic way, we can perform in the same way, short term, and even better for the long term, because of better living soils. What we do also is that we invest into uh, the forest, the forest you know, in, in, uh, in cognac and around, because we need the forest also for the birds, and we need also to, to leave trees for the next generations. So the first two are really uh, linked to our economy, and the third one is goes beyond. And what we do, and thanks to you, is uh, we're going to invest also in, in different places of the world. And we decided also with your projects to go in, uh, in Africa, uh, in China, in the US. And I just want to mention you know, one example to so what ACT means, and, and also uh, the way we look as, at the monitoring. Um, we decided to invest into a, a project in Kenya, in the Mount Kenya. It's, it's a drop in the oceans, but I think it's interesting to see the way we, we do that. So let me look perhaps at, at the KPIs to really understand you know, uh, what we do. 400 hectares is really what we know we are uh, your team has been also doing in terms of uh, regenerations of the forest. Uh, 250,000 uh, seedlings. No, that's okay, because it's not only about you know, seedlings, it's what you do around. Uh, 200 farmers also helping also to adapt um, regenerations. We plan over the years, because it's only, not only now, it's for the years to come, that 20,000 people will be positively impacted uh, thanks to that you know, new economic uh, development. And, and, and lastly, uh, 37,000 uh, tons of carbon will be absorbed. So we will, we will use even more uh, KPIs, but that's the way we go. We know we only improve what we measure. Mm. So uh, what we do for us and what we do for, 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 for the, our share to the mankind, I would say. Thank you. And thank you for sharing this example on Kenya. Actually, it's a, it's a people's project, and, and Reforest Action provides support to them. Uh, to share best practices and, uh, and to monitor. And this is a perfect transition actually because we've talked about what we need to do, the relationship we need to develop, um, our behavior with nature. Do we belong to nature? Do we use nature? But these are words, aren't they? Uh, we need actions, we need to act, we need act tank uh, uh, or do tanks rather than think tanks maybe. Um, and I would like now us to, to share best practices for action. And maybe we can start with you, Nicole, uh, on what are the best practices to protect existing forests? Because it's our starting point, isn't it? Thank you, Stefan. I think what I'd like to, to emphasize is, uh, in terms of best practices, is really integrated solutions. I mean, we've already talked about the need for these multi-stakeholder coalitions, but also in terms of the thinking, like really starting to think about conservation as, as an integrated part of, of any approach to looking at trees and forests and, and restoration. And there are some very interesting models um, of using restoration as a way to halt deforestation, for example, right? And, and so really this interconnection between livelihoods, providing new sources of livelihoods through agroforestry, very interesting developments happening in agroforestry and in, in providing markets for new crops from forests, which can then sustain the livelihoods of, um, of communities, bring back native species that were not necessarily cared for because um, they didn't have such a such a, um, a potential in the market and that now are coming back that are enabling these communities to live with the trees and therefore also spurring conservation. So what I see is a really this very interesting um, models when we take a holistic view and when we don't just think about one part of it in isolation. And, um, and I do want to um, emphasize also in terms of the conservation um, aspect, 
uh, we we always think about threatened species, about you know animals mainly, but there's also huge work now going on looking at trees and, and threatened tree species, and what are the ways to bring those back and to bring back biodiversity into forests and, and to focus on these. So it gives me a lot of hope because I think um, there is a lot happening. It's still at a scale that's you know too small at the moment, but we can look at these examples, we can look at what's happening in, in the tropical forest in the Amazon, for example, around cocoa, right? So, so this deforestation, restoration, and how do we turn something that is currently a threat into something that can become an opportunity and actually serve uh, for conservation as well. And, and finally, I, I do want to, um, uh, in terms of, I mean, best practices, talk a little bit also about youth and, and again, the, the restoration generation and these ecopreneurs, because we're seeing more and more examples of businesses and whether it's, um, or community enterprises or initiatives, and it can be technology, right? So a new way to monitor the survival of trees or that can then be one of the pieces in this puzzle to help catalyze the whole system. And there's more and more young people who want to engage in this space, but want to know how can we make a living out of it. So if we can show that these regenerative business models uh, are working, I think that's that's huge, uh, huge opportunity. And I'm very um, just uh, last uh, last few examples, as you know, Stefan, we've been working to see how we can support the Great Green Wall initiative uh, in the Sahel. And there's a lot of fascinating examples there, whether it's around uh, the She Butter Alliance and, and, and communities of women on, you know, developing She Butter and preserving those trees, whether it's around Baobab and finding new markets for, for Baobab for some of these crops. And I think these are the things we need to highlight and elevate so that we can scale and, and encourage more of these solutions that are anchored in the communities. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Nicole. Um, yes, restoration can also drive um, protection, uh, as you said, uh, through agroforestry or other means. And by the way, the Great Green Wall in Africa is not a wall, actually, right? It's, it's, a, it's a collection of projects, uh, re uh, forest restoration projects that uh, make a green wall all together. Um, now, Tim, according to you, um, how do you think we should integrate adaptation policy directly into diverse forest restoration? Is there an opportunity here for, from the state? So in uh, principle, of course, the closer you get to the ground, the more these uh, abstract concepts merge. If you have an intact forest, uh, it can provide resilience, it can sequester carbon, it can uh, help with livelihoods. And the key is really to get the planning of restoration and of conservation right, to involve people, to listen to nature, to plant if you must plant trees, plant the right tree at the right time in the right place. So these are very basic uh, principles. And of course, uh, there is then a much more detailed guidance on all kinds of ecosystems that we're compiling and that we will put on the digital hub for the UN decade. So whether you want to restore a seagrass meadow or a coral reef or a tropical forest or a mountainside, uh, there will be guidance that tells you more in detail how to do that. Um, in general, though, the, these three rules apply. You uh, must begin with the end in mind. What is your societal objective? And of course, they always nowadays include climate objectives, but they also usually go beyond, whether it's to grow uh, the supply chain for agri-commodity uh, businesses uh, or um, recreation or others. Secondly, you must listen to and involve people. Thirdly, you must listen to and uh, work with nature. So there are you know, it's it's maybe a bit of an oversimplification, but then again, the world is a big place and it always depends on the local context and the socioeconomic context when you plan a restoration project. But of course, we will then have on the digital hub and on Tom's restore platform and elsewhere, the much more detailed guidance that is needed for people to take action. Before we um, listen to, to Jen Goodall, um, um, I would like um, to ask you Tom, um, what the best practices you have in mind for us to, to protect and restore? You, you mentioned um, earlier on transparency and monitoring. Uh, what do you have in mind? Is there any other um, uh, best practices you could share with us? I think I'd say I firstly agree with everything that's been said. There's not one best practice, but it's 
about connecting and connectivity across across the the space we we every single one of us needs to sort of have a a bit of a or at least society needs to have a bit of a reframe this is not just about global climate a global climate topic you know there's so much debate among scientists and politicians about whether nature based solutions could even distract energy away from technological solutions to climate change and things like that and it's essentially you know the fact of the matter is nature is certainly one of the you know one of the contributing uh, you know the tools in our tool belt uh, one of the many many solutions that are needed to address climate change but it's also so much more than that nature's not just an option to compensate or offset our emissions as mark mentioned it's the source of sustainable economic futures it's the place where our biodiversity exists which is essential to all life so even if climate change stops right away the protection and rebuilding of biodiversity is still a top priority in every possible context. Uh, and obviously the key to that is that we understand that this is a local challenge. It's not just for us all to debate it in high, you know, in our high ivory towers. It's a local challenge for the local biodiversity and the communities that depend on that biodiversity. Um, so I think this reframing is important and it's the, the value that nature brings to those local communities that makes it so incredible. Um, but then it's as that value is, is propagated across the world that we all benefit. And I guess one of the more encouraging aspects of, of the nature, the nature based solutions part of this topic is that it's about every one of us. It's, it's, it's not just isolated to those projects or to those locations. So the, the sort of those local projects are more and more and more successful, the more that we as a society engage with the movement to collaborate with them or support the, the, the efforts directly by, you know, you know, literally collaborating and supporting, but also indirectly through every single decision we make, if it, whether it's about choosing a sustainably sourced coffee shop or investing in an organization that is committed to an integrated uh, and well-connected effort to preserve and, and, and protect nature, we can, we can impact biodiversity and nature through every single one of our actions because we are all intrinsically connected to the land and, and the biodiversity on it. We see climate and biodiversity as uh, twin challenges. And uh, I think what we've seen together, what we've discussed is that we have a challenge uh, which could be an opportunity, actually, which is to restore, uh, protect and restore um, forests at a large scale, one billion hectares, um, roughly. Now, what we've seen as, as well is that there is momentum. There is momentum with coalitions like One T, Imagine, and, and the CBA. Um, we know the best practices. We know that we need money. We need support. We need everybody's commitment on that topic and it's happening, which is very positive news. I'm, I'm very positive myself about what's coming up, but I feel like I've got still a lot to learn and to learn from you, Dr. Jen Goodall. And um, I'm very honored to, to welcome you and um, we would be very happy to listen to, to your keynote from the UK, Dr. Jen Goodall. Well, um, good morning, everybody, and thank you. And you have to realize that I've been put in rather a difficult position because I had a nice little talk all ready to, to give at the beginning of this panel, but now I'm plunged into the middle of it. We don't know what was wrong with the technology, but it simply didn't work. And finally, I get on and I listen to all of these comments that have been made. And now I have to completely change what I was going to say. And so you'll have to forgive me if it's a slightly disjointed series of thoughts that I've had while listening, along with what I was going to say before. And I think the best thing I can do is to say, first of all, I first dreamed of going out into the forests of Africa when I was a child of 10. And reading the books that many of them you see behind me. I'm speaking from my home in the UK, uh, where I have been since the beginning of the pandemic, absolutely grounded here, and having to do my normal touring uh, through Zooms and things like that. Normally they work. This is a very unusual occasion. So 
I got to Gombe, as everybody knows, to study chimpanzees. And while I was in the rainforest, not only did I learn about the chimpanzees and how like us they are, and all of this information, which really changed scientific thinking, because when I got to Cambridge, finally, I was told the difference between us and other animals was one of kind. And of course, that's not true. And I'd been taught by my childhood companion, my dog, Rusty, that that wasn't true. But in addition to learning about the chimps, and our relationship with the animal kingdom. I spent hours and hours on my own in the forests. And it was there that I learned about the interconnection of all living things. It was there that I learned that every little species of plant and animal, no matter how small and insignificant it may seem, has a role to play in this fantastic, miraculous tapestry of life. And as each little species is disappearing, and we are in the midst of the sixth great extinction, I see it as a whole torn in the tapestry. And if we continue in this way, then the tapestry will be in such tatters, there will be no return. So it was, you know, the happiest days, the most wonderful days of my life out in the forest. So why did I leave? I left because in 1986 at a big conference, it was bringing together those people by then studying chimpanzees. And it was mainly to find out how chimpanzee behavior differed or didn't in different environments. And was there something like cultural transmission, which there is. But we also had a session on conservation. And yes, I knew about deforestation, but I was shocked by then there were six other field sites and everywhere were pictures of destroyed forests. Everywhere scientists were talking about reduced numbers of chimpanzees. And so I went as a scientist, I left as an activist. I knew I had to try to do something. I didn't know what to do. So got together a bit of money, managed to get to six different range countries, learned a lot about the problems facing the chimpanzees. But I also learned about the problems of so many of the people living in and around the chimpanzee habitats, which are forest. Learned about the crippling poverty, the lack of good health and education, the degradation of the land. And it came to a head when I flew in a small plane over the tiny Gombe National Park. It's only 35 square kilometers. And when I began in 1960 and even in 1970, it was part of this great equatorial forest belt that stretched almost unbroken from East Africa, Western East Africa to the West African coast. When I flew over in the late 1980s, I was utterly shocked. It was a small island of forest surrounded as far as you could see by completely bare hills. It's very, uh, it's, it's composed of a lot of steep valleys. It's part of the Western, um, Western branch of the Great Rift Valley running down to Lake Tanganyika. So there are very steep valleys and only in the very steepest places was there no deforestation where people couldn't get. And the people living there, there were more than the land could support. Overused farmland, infertile, too poor to buy food elsewhere, most of them, struggling to survive. And that's when it hit me. There's no way we can save chimpanzees and their forests or anything else of nature unless we find ways for people to live without destroying the environment. And so we began the Jane Goodall Institute program of Take Care or Takari. And it started off very holistic. The first money that I started it with a wonderful, wonderful George Stronden, who's half French. And we tried to get funding from the European Union. The biggest problem we faced was they said, you're not asking for enough money. We don't give these small grants. And we said, but nobody else is doing this holistic thing. They said, well, you can't do everything. You have to choose. We said, well, what's the point of choosing to educate people if they're going to die because there's no health facilities and so on? Finally, we, we managed and we got 
a grant over three years. And we started it in a very holistic way, not with a bunch of arrogant white people going into poor African villages, 12 of them around Gombe, but a team of locally picked Tanzanians who the villagers trusted. And they sat down and said, what do you think we can do to help you? Grow more food, okay, restore the fertility to the land, no chemical pesticides and so on. And they wanted better health and educational facilities. We worked with the local Tanzanian government. And then as people began to trust us, we were able to introduce water management plans, uh, working on the watersheds. We introduced microcredit programs because Mohammed Yunus took me to Bangladesh and I was so impressed. And this gave women the opportunity to start their own environmentally sustainable small businesses. Uh, we provided scholarships to keep girls in school and give them a chance to go into secondary education and maybe even on to university, which at that time in that place was something almost impossible, but it was impossible. And it's been shown all over the world that as women's education improves, family size tends to drop. The problems there were the number of children. It was common to have eight to 10 children. And we provided family planning information, which was very eagerly received because the people wanted to educate their children. They got this idea now, education will lift us out of poverty. But they didn't know what to do about it. Now they could choose. They could choose to have small families. They could choose to devote time to their businesses and things began to change. Then the next step was to in introduce up-to-date cutting edge uh, technology, GIS, GPS and satellite imagery. And uh, so we trained from each of the, by now we're in 104 villages throughout the whole chimp range in Tanzania. We trained volunteers from each of these villages to use smartphones. So even if they couldn't read or write, they could go into their forest because every one of these villages has a forest reserve, most of which were very, very depleted by then. But they're so proud of this. And they got together and they chose what they would record. So they recorded an illegally cut tree, an animal trap, cartridge on the ground, a chimpanzee nest, a pangolin, a leopard paw print. And all of this went up to this platform in the clouds, Global Forest Watch. So it was all transparent. It was transparent to us who were running the program. It was transparent also to the uh, local chiefs, the leaders in the, in the villages and to the politicians. So the villagers now, these 104 villages, they have become our partners in conservation because they understand protecting the environment is for their future and not just to protect wildlife. So this program is now in six other African countries around uh, chimpanzee areas where we're working. It's, uh, if you now fly over the Gombe National Park, you will not see bare hills. They're not there anymore because either the villagers, they've all made their land use management plans and they've set aside land to just leave it to regenerate. And you know, the magic of the seeds and sometimes the roots of trees that were there left in the soil, how this regenerates, but also a lot of tree planting around the edge of the forest. And so as these programs gave such hope and gave the people such hope, and as the poverty level decreased and as their engagement grew, it was very clear, it was costing a lot of money and I was traveling more and more. And all around the world, I was meeting young people who seemed to have lost hope in the future that we'd compromised their future. There was nothing we could do about it. You hear, we haven't inherited this planet from our ancestors. We borrowed it from our children. We haven't been borrowing their future. We've been stealing it for years and years and years, as long a time 
as we have been destroying the planet's forests. Um, but is it too late? No, and you've all said the same thing. There is hope, but for there to be hope, we need to get together and take action now. So I began a program which we call Roots and Shoots. It's part of the Jane Goodall Institute. It's our environmental and humanitarian program for youth. Started with 12 high school students in Tanzania. It's now got members from preschool through university in 68 countries and growing fast with thousands of groups. The main message being every individual makes a difference every day and every group choosing three projects to make the world better. One to help people, one to help animals, one to help the environment. So for years now, since 1991, young people, as they choose something to help the environment, trees, planting trees, planting organic vegetables, but planting trees. And just in the last two years, um, our Roots and Shoots groups have planted millions of trees especially in Africa, where it's so needed. Part of that um, fighting deforestation, fighting the spread of the encroachment of the desert in the Sahel. So this is giving me great hope. The way the young people are absolutely learning about nature. We have programs, we take them into the forest. You can't want to protect something if you don't know it. And some of you have already talked about our disconnect with nature as we move into cities, as children spend more and more time on their little gadgets and they're not even looking. I've seen them walk through, walk through areas of beauty and they're not looking, they're just looking in their, in their cell phones or whatever it is they look at. Even brought a group of young people to Gombe and found them sitting on their cell phones and they were up in the, in the peaks, surrounded by this amazing nature. So this reconnecting children to nature is a really, really important part of our Roots and Shoots program. And in all of these African countries, it's a main component of everything that we're trying to do. And because we began in 1991, we now have young people who are beginning to take their place in the adult decision-making world. We have two in Africa, ministers of environment who were in Roots and Shoots as children. When I go to China, people come up and say, but of course I care about the environment. I was in your Roots and Shoots program in primary school because we started there in 1994. And that's just one small component of what's going on on the planet. Everywhere I go, there are wonderful stories from people doing incredible things, reforestation, protecting forests, learning about forests, learning to love so that you can then want to preserve. But you know, there are problems. And yes, we can have all these great ideas of all that we're going to do and governmental decisions and signatures of treaties, but you see examples under your, under your very nose that this can be overturned by a new leader, like President Trump walking out of the Paris Climate Accord and overturning almost every single environmental protection in the United States. So we have to, we have to overcome that. And I can only see the young people growing up with a different way of thinking and we have to eliminate poverty because I've seen with my own eyes out in nature, if people are poor, they're going to cut down the last trees because they've got to live. They've got to grow food for their family. They've got to sell charcoal to get some money. They're going to fish the last fish, not because they don't understand, they do, but they're desperate to stay alive. We all have that feeling if we're threatened with death, I believe. And so in the cities, the, in the urban areas, the poor people, they're going to buy the cheapest food. They can't afford to say, did it harm the environment? Has it got unsustainable forestry products in it? They're going to buy the cheapest to stay alive. 
And there's one other thing, somebody, one of you talked about the importance of greening our cities. It's so important, very, very important. In fact, our roots and shoots groups in the cities are trying to do just that. But if you go through a big city in America, you go through the parts where the affluent people live, you get tree-lined streets, you get parks. It's beautiful, birds are up there. Go into a deprived area, there's cement, it's bleak, there's hardly any green. And yet when you plant trees and other kinds of vegetation, crime levels drop and health improves. So we need forests. And that lesson I learned from the rainforests of Gombe, the interconnection of everything, shows that we can only solve the problems we face. The, the climate crisis, the loss of biodiversity, leading to all these forest fires that are horrible, still continuing to chop down primary rainforests, even when it's illegal. So to solve these problems, we do all have to get together. We do have to see it as an integrated whole. We do have to understand we are part of the natural world and we depend on it for our very future. And so we need to get together and sit down and talk and try and foresee the problems that we sometimes create. As we solve one problem, we create another. You all know that. So we need people to think about, yes, if we solve this problem in this way, now we're going to create another one. So how do we solve that before we even make it? So that's the thoughts I put together while I was listening to you. And the main message is, yes, there is hope. Hope in the young people who are so passionate. Hope in the resilience of nature. We destroy it, but give it a chance and maybe some help and it can be restored. Um, and endangered species can be given another chance. And there's what I call the indomitable human spirit, the people who fight what seems impossible and won't give up and so often succeed. Some of them lose their lives in doing it. And of course, we've got this clever brain. Well, is it clever with compared with chimps who have a brain so like ours? We are the most intellectual creature that's ever walked the planet. But we can't say we're intelligent because we're destroying our only home. Now, finally, we're bringing the brains together, bringing them together to work out ways of taking action so that we can leave behind us a world that's a little better for our children. And in turn, they can leave behind a world that's a little better for their children. And so the future of the planet can be ensured if we get together now and take action. And that's what this conference is all about. How do we do it? Let's get together and let's say, yes, we can and yes, we will create a better world for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane, if I may call you Jane. Um, I think through your experience, you show us the way. Um, because you've used a number of words that uh, we've discussed during the last hour or so. We've, you've talked about preserving and restoring forests. You've talked about local populations. You've talked about relationship with nature and maybe harmony. You've talked about ecopreneurs and money. We need money. We need people who run projects, nature-based projects. You've talked about education, about technology for transparency. You've talked about action, action now and it's everybody's action. And you view the word together. Um, you provided me emotion. I'm pretty sure you can see that. You started your adventure, your personal adventure, um, with emotion, an emotion you had in, uh, in Gambia. Uh, I hope this round table will provide emotion to most people, so it's a very good starting point for change. I would like to thank you again. I would like to thank uh, as well our panelists, 
Nico, Tom, Tim, Mark, Laurent, Jane, thank you very much for being with us today.